Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me today on this uh, cold and wet day. Um, well, it is, it is where I am. Um, we're going to talk about emailing to cold data. Uh, my name is Simon Moss. I look after the marketing at Spotler. Um, and <clears throat> we do a lot of email marketing, obviously, and um, we do take advantage of um, being able to purchase data. So hopefully what I will talk to you about is some first-hand experience and, and, and ideas to help you on your way. <coughs> so uh, a couple of logistics before we start. Webinar is being recorded. Um, so you will get a copy of the webinar. Obviously, you'll get a copy of the slides and we'll have a Q&A at the end. So you can the, the, the best thing is if you ask questions throughout or you can submit them all at the end. But there'll be five, 10 minutes where myself and my colleague Susanna will be on and we'll try and answer all the questions that you've had. Maybe I might answer all of them as I go through the slides anyway, but it's a great time if you want to ask anything, any technical questions, any questions about data, and, and emailing purchase data as such, um, please feel free to use the, ch the questions or, or the chat to, to do so. Um, as I said, there, I, I, I always have a lot of slides when I do events, whether it's webinars or seminars, so you will get a copy of them. You don't feel that you need to write everything down that's gonna go through. We will send you a copy of the slides and you will get a copy of the recording. Right, without further ado. Um, what I want to cover today is legality. I still get the question is, you know, is it legal um, to do data purchase and send to emails? So I want to cover that bit. I also want to go through some cold email ideas. So kind of the methods of, of what we see and what we see our customers and what I see within the industry. Then we've recently written um, uh, the 10 most engaging formulas uh, for when writing emails. So I want to share that with you. We've just produced a playbook. Um, so you'll get a copy or you can download a copy of that, but I'm gonna go through a few of it where and this means you can just lift the text and change your name, uh, change our name to yours as such. It's that kind of playbook that you can implement for cold data. And as I said, at the end of it, we'll have a, a Q and A so you can ask any questions so um that's that's what i'm looking to cover so let's get straight into it as this one says there's, there's confu confusion and the, this is a confusion that i want to cover can i buy data for b2b email campaigns and do i need consent for b2b marketing so i definitely want to try and um alleviate that that confusion that might be out there and it all kind of starts with GDPR, if that makes sense, and this is where most of the confusion comes from. Um, and the, you know, the, it's been the big, the biggest change in the data protection legislation for a long time. It's not, it's definitely not a new piece of legislation. And the bit that we'll talk about that sits with it is is not new. Um, it's just an evolution, really, of existing rules. It's a move from rules to principles. GDPR switches the ownership of data from company to the consumer. So um, I can see why there's been a bit of confusion uh, around it. But um, the bit that we want to look at is you've got two options as a marketer. You you can process your data through consent, and as GDPR says written um, written consent, whether that's electronic or oral. Um, and it's ticking a box, choosing technical settings, any any other contact that clearly indicates acceptance. Um, does not include silence, pre-tick boxes or activity is what GDPR says from a consent point of view. Or you can go under legitimate interest. So it's the, uh, an alternative legal basis for processing data um and it's kind of do you have a relationship is there a reasonable expectation uh have you given them prov provisions of uh, an opt-out or an unsubscribe and you've got the ico you can use their balancing test of how you identify legitimate interest but is people take as long as you've got your personas written out you've got job titles in your database and you can show that actually this target audience are audiences that by your service or solution, then you've got a version of your um, uh, balancing test and you have your legitimate interest 
generally written out um, as long as it's balanced against the individual rights. So hopefully that that makes sense. The big bit where people get confused is that you've got consent or legitimate interest in it saying, well, I, do I have consent to send to purchase data? And that's where the e-privacy regulation, I've called it a regulation because it, 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 that's what's coming in. It's a directive at the moment. It, it's not coming. The It will replace the current e-privacy directive, but your guess will be as good as anybody's of when that's actually meant to happen. Because it's been going over the last couple of years that the regulation's meant to be in. But the key bit in the UK is PECA. And that is the Privacy and Electronic communications regulation which sits alongside um, GD, GDPR and what it basically means is GDPR it doesn't specify which legal ground you should use it just gives you six grounds for processing data as I said generally for marketers it will be consent or legitimate interest. Uh, PECA says that marketing emails require consent for individuals. Now that's the interesting bit, and that's the, the legal term. B2B emails do not require consent um, because B2B emails are not deemed individual. They're, they are not deemed a individual to subscriber. They're deemed a corporate subscriber. So an individual describer is you or me with my Gmail, um, sole traders or partnerships. Your business email address, or technically, even if you were using Gmail as your business email address, that would then be considered a corporate subscriber. So in the B2B context, uh, PECA says that you do not need consent. You just need to make sure that, that obviously the message is appropriate. Um, it includes an opt-out process and you're not hiding your identity, if that makes sense. So from a is it legal point of view, Absolutely. Um, the ICO, you can look at the DMA um, and all of it goes along the lines of B2B emails do not require consent because PECA allows for that to be as opt-outs. Um, different, again, different part if it's individual email. So if you're, if you're B2C and you're emailing to consumers, then in most cases you will need consent. But in the B2B world, we're covered by PECA at the moment. That's obviously going through the e-privacy regulation. And however that falls out, we'll all find out at some point, but it won't be this year. And I can't imagine it will be any point next year, what with um, Brexit and everything happening at the moment. So the only other bits when buying data from a B2B point of view is probably um, due diligence. So when you're looking to buy data, make sure you kind of do a bit of due diligence, I can't say it, due diligence to make sure that you're asking where the list is compiled from, has it been amended, how often is it updated, what methods is the data purchaser, uh, data uh, provider using, um, how is it provided. So all of these bits, you know, does it cover um, text, is it screened against TP, TPS or CTPS, so the Corporate Telephone Preference Service, um you know how do they deal with complaints can you get a sample of data most decent um data providers will give you an example and then there's just other bits that you can check you know is, is that data provider a member of a professional body like the dma or, or sim or anything along those lines so that the ico expect you to you know make sure you've actually asked the questions before you buy data to that you've actually made sure it's not some kind of dodgy data that you're you're buying if that makes sense I'm hoping. So, conclusion: Can I buy B? Can I buy data for B two B email campaigns? Absolutely. Do I need consent? Absolutely not. So, you can process that data under legitimate interest. So, um, hopefully, that clears everything up. As I said, if you've got questions on that, by all means, please put them into the questions at the end, and we'll do a bit of a Q and A and can elaborate if we need to. But hopefully, that clears up any part of purchase data, whether it's legal or not. Um, and you can find all of that information out on the ICO website or the DMA website that corroborates what we've just talked about. But legitimate interest is absolutely fine to use to process your purchase data. Right. So I promised some cold email ideas, and this is probably the, the better bit of the, the webinar. Now we've got that uh, kind of legal bit out. So at Spotler, we do 
cold emails day in, day out. Our customers also take advantage of in the UK being able to send to purchase data. And it is a really good method of trying to get more leads to your website. So we, we look at cold data as top of the funnel marketing, trying to get them engaged onto the websites and um, engaging with certain types of campaigns. So that's what I want to cover. But before I go into those emails, I kind of want to look at um, subject lines because they are the first thing if you actually get into the inbox. Um, this is what people make the decision on to actually engage with your email or open your email. And if they are bland, benign, and inept, you know, kind of um, spotler news or December newsletter or something that's just so generic it doesn't make me want to open it the i don't know if you know but the average number of emails a b2b um a b2b inbox gets is about 121 emails a day so no matter what you're doing you're fighting over and for the attention between 121 ever emails that i've been sent that day and unfortunately, you're not my boss and you're not my mum. So you're not going to get my attention. So you need to do something to stand out um, in that inbox. And the subject line is a great way of, of doing that. So there's just a few things that we notice that work well. Again, we've got so many resources on Spotter if you want to have a look at the great British uh, split tests that we do with subject lines and, and content, by all means, have a look at that. But what we notice is, you know, adding some personalization into the subject line. So whether that's their name, their, their company name, something that they're using. So for us, it kind of works well if we know that you're using one of our competitors like MailChimp or HubSpot and putting that into the subject line. Um, anything that we can make it as specific as possible increases, I've, I've mentioned open rate there, but that's just rubbish, but increases the engagement. So um, subject line, Use, making it personal is, is really good. So if you've got those data points of people's names of any other kind of key data points against that account or that person, that helps get that engagement. As I said, you, you're fighting against 121 emails um, if you're lucky enough to end in the inbox and not other or junk sometimes. Um, so I'll put here, if you wonder if it sounds too much like a marketing email, then it probably does sound too much like a marketing email. And what I mean by that is marketers, we're really great at writing, um, uh, doing email marketing and writing kind of email campaigns. But when you're doing cold emails, I would rather you write it as if you were gonna drop your colleague an email. Um, you know, So by all means, there might be a typo in that subject line because you can't be bothered to read it properly when you send it to a colleague. Um, but it, it, it needs to be those emails for cold emails are hopefully more personal and they're not as structured as a marketing person would do them for you like your newsletters, if that makes sense. Um, we put in here experiment with symbols, questions in the subject line. And what we mean by that is, you're doing something different. Um, keep it short, stand out. Symbols you don't see as much in the B2B arena. You definitely see them in B2C. So Black Friday, um, we had loads of symbols, you know, when it gets to Valentine's, Christmas, everything, symbols are out. And what is shown from the research out there is that having symbols, having uh, personalization and subject lines get be gets better performance, better engagement. So definitely give it a go. Um, and then we kind of won the, the last one there is deliver what you've promised, which is generally a given. But, um, you know, if, if you're saying that there's going to be uh, uh, an asset at the end of it, then make sure that somebody can get that asset. If it's for an event, obviously, make sure they can book on. If it's demo sales free trial, then deliver what you've, you, you've put in there. But the subject line, um, other than who it's from. The subject line, I believe, is the most important part of your email marketing. That's a bit where people will take two seconds to say, oh, God, I'm going to delete that or I might save it for later or look at it. So subject lines, vitally important. Um, can't uh, can't stress that enough. And as marketeers, we're, um, we probably spend about five seconds on doing a subject line. It's kind of, oh, I've got an email to go out. What should we put in it? 
Ah, cool. Yeah, December newsletter. Lovely. Uh, really, really useful. Uh, so spend a little bit more time on your subject lines, please, and make sure they're as best as they can be, even so much so where you're doing some kind of um, focus group. You know, uh, if you're, we're, I'm lucky enough to have marketeers and we target marketeers. So I'll run subject lines past our team, or if we target salespeople, we'll run them past the sales team just to see whether it stands out or catches their attention. So um, definitely put a bit more time into subject lines than you might normally would. Um, I, I liken it a little bit to PPC. You would never go and put a click here or something generic and ambiguous. Uh, sorry, something gener generic um, and banal in a PPC ad. You will tailor that content. So make sure that first bit of who it's from, what it says, and probably your um, preview line, make sure that is as tailored as possible. Right. Next bit. So approaches to cold emails used today. In, in my mind, give or take, there's two approaches. One is you are emailing somebody high up in the organization asking for a referral. And number two is you're emailing the decision maker pitching to them. So we, we've gone straight into sales mode here, um, uh, which we can do with cold data. So there's, there's a couple of methods, but I'm, I'm taking you through the, 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 salesy, the salesy method, if you like. Um, and what I mean by that is I've got some examples. So this is a referral of, can you point me in the right direction? You know, hi, Simon, sorry to trouble you. Uh, would you be so kind to tell me who's responsible for marketing automation or generating leads um, or recruiting or something? And how I might be able to get in touch with them. I'm asking for a referral. OK, and this is our version of it for a CEO persona. So hi, Stuart out of the blue email, but I want to get in touch about automation and lead gen. We've just launched our AI powered platform. And I think your sales and marketing team could get greater conversions, leads and pipeline. Have you got five minutes or can you put me in touch with somebody? So this is a, to blow my own trumpet, hopefully a decent example of a, a referral. And what you can see in the subject line is we put out the company name that we're going after because we're going after, um, Ricard Luckin on this one was the, the one that I've impersonated. And we are trying to show them why, what the benefit is. AI is quite, um, not quite new, but it's still relatively new within the uh, marketing automation sphere of people actually using AI. So we're trying to give a, a reason. As I said, this is for a CEO persona. If I was going after a uh, a marketing director asking for a referral to a marketing manager, this would, the wording would be slightly tailored differently. Okay. So that's a referral. I don't, I, I don't know whether you get those, but I get these quite often when um, people are trying to get through to either a salesperson or somebody in my marketing team and they want me to pass it on or, or reference them on. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. It, it all depends on whether that. Once I opened it, that proposition is compelling enough for me to act on. But it's a a, a good start from a, a cold call, cold campaign point of view, if you're buying data that way. Um, <clears throat> sorry, a bit of a cough. The other one is the, the selling. Um, what we kind of notice is marketeers are marketeers and they want to send out useful stuff, which absolutely fine, but we sometimes have lost the art um, uh, from a marketing point of view of just helping the sales team sell and um, by all means go ahead and do some salesy emails to cold data or when I say cold data it could even be data in your CRM that you got at the moment you might want to do some targeted sales emails so you know uh, hi Simon hope to see my find you well I just wanted to reach out because we've just one um, ex customer in your industry and they're getting some great um, click throughs, some great performance, you know, uh, the platform can help you do X, Y, and Z. Just, you know, those kind of sales emails to try and push the point of get a quick call, a quick demo, um, actually work quite well. And this is a version for us, which is a sales persona. And we've tagged this as, you know, my, my boss has asked me to reach out to you, which we've seen work quite well. So as you can see at the bottom here, it looks like Lee, who's our CEO, has um, asked Amy to reach out. And so then Amy's got one here saying, hi, Stuart, my CEO's asked me to reach out to you. We help companies like yours improve your lead gen. Um, here's a link to our white paper, which explains a little bit more. Can we 
uh, set up a call this week to discuss. And what you generally get here is that that person, if they look at this, they'll also read the one below by the CEO saying, reach out to Ricard Lucking, we think we can really help them. So it's kind of got that, that push from a, a CEO asking to reach out. Um, and these one again, these ones are, they work quite well for us. We do different variations of them, but this is to a sales persona. So sales persona is all about lead gen, trying to get more money in their pocket, more leads, more follow-up calls to go on to. So you need to make sure, again, you've written out, we wouldn't send this one to a CEO, for example. If we sent it to a marketing person, we'd probably do a slightly different variation. So I hope that makes sense. You, the, the two methods from, a, from what you can use at a cold data point of view is you've got the referral from a higher up or you've got the selling, if that makes sense. But what I want to then talk about is kind of what we do at Spotler as well is... Um, you got some people in our business call it a phishing campaign and some of us call it an injection of love. The phishing campaign is slightly different in that you have, uh, we're gonna carry on with the phishing analogy here, so um, uh, please bear with it. You've got one type of bait and you're gonna try and, you're gonna try your luck. So in this case, you kind of cast your net wide and see if you get a bite. Again, personas can come in useful here because you might just overlay that um, particular content and change it but that bait is the same so it could be download a resource it could be book onto an event it could be take a look at our latest and greatest blog if that makes sense and you might change that wording or how you write it depending for that persona um, but you've got one bait you're going to have a go at it and that's it the injection of love scenario if you like is slightly different it's, it's a variation of the fishing campaign but here you're trying to be a bit more targeted um you know hence the, the injection of love and um you're delivering over a time frame so you might have different series of job functions i.e sales marketing finance recruitment hr and rather than it being one or two emails there might be five emails in a drip series that you're trying to show the love um, it's more tailored so what i mean by that is you know email one is more of a value you're trying to connect so you know you want freshly prepared sales lead delivered daily then take a look at our guide um, on how to deliver targeted comms um so that one we're giving something useful hopefully not so much of a hard hard sell Next one, again, a bit more of a value. I want to check in, see if you've got my email. We work with a number of companies in the industry to generate leads, with lots of plugins for CRMs, so where you can see everything in one place. And again, this bit here is what we've notified is our marketing personas. They, when somebody's looking to leave a, a provider like MailChimp, uh, .digital, HubSpot, the re, one of the reasons is they're looking to have everything in one place. So it's not just email and IP lookup and CRM. It's all, all in one place and the integration is important. So we're trying to work on those persona points. Um, credibility, obviously, if you've got testimonials, case studies, uh, trust pilot reviews, um, we're trying to show you that um, we are, are relevant and we've got customers that can back it up. So we're trying to get across the credibility there. <clears throat> value again there's not many as i said there's not many people in the industry that are doing ai we, we're one of the few people that are doing predictive click-through rates on campaigns and predictive unsubscribes so you can kind of send to certain people so again uh, we've got a, guide, a white paper on the beginner's guide to ai so we're trying to do a bit more value and then <clears throat> the last one in the series we're going to go for a sales one which is you're busy but have you got 15 minutes to book a meeting um, obviously, the sales team can be calling in and out through all of this and people can come in and out of it. But I hope that gives you an idea of a bit of a, an injection of love um, methodology uh, to sending emails. And the phishing campaign, as I said, so somewhat similar, but you might just be going after one thing for a couple. Uh, you might have one bit of bait over a couple of times. So, um, again, they're really useful because you can have leads and let them run and the sales guys these can come from your sales team, look like the sales guys are sending it. And within their follow-up process, they can just make the calls. Uh, they don't need to send the emails, which is a, a bonus. Because we all know salespeople are the laziest team within within the business. Sorry, salespeople on the call. Um, but it, it's marketing, absolutely know it. <laughs> Only joking, uh, kind of a joke. Right, what I also wanted to do, 
was we went over engaging cold formulas. So those emails that we write are generally based on some well-known formulas, which um, if you get this URL, as I said, at the end of it, you'll get the slides, so you'll get this URL, you'll be able to get it. And what we've done is we've written a, um, a document for you, for you that you can look at of how to write some email campaigns. These are generally the one-to-one -one email campaigns that you might write as you send out of Outlook, but again, you can add these into your, into your um, injections of love, if you like, or your, or your workflows. But what you'll notice is most of these are based on, will be based on theory. The top one, I imagine most of you will have come across ADA, which is awareness, interest, desire, and action. So it's being able to write them in certain methods, um, and we've given them funky names, but you'll you'll get the idea. I'm not going to go through each one, but um, PPP, praise, picture, push, which we'll go over in a second, um, sell through stories. I, what I've done there is I, we tried to give you methodologies if you're trying to write something. And what I mean by that is if we look at PPP, when it comes to this, it's a three part copywriting structure that builds kind of de facto personalization into compelling copy. Compelling copy. Um, it's all grounded. This one's grounded in flattery. Um, you know, we praise, compliment the recipients, picture, paint a picture of how your solution can help and push, encourage them to take action. Let's say it works on the one hand by congratulating the recipients of their achievements, uh, makes your message personal. Um, but more importantly, flattery goes a long way, uh, makes people feel good. And what I mean by that is, is an example here. Hi, Rita, congrats. Just saw you were chosen a speaker for the 2018 Inbound Marketing Conference. There's a bit of praise. Um, as you're preparing for your presentation, it's natural to fall behind ever tasks on your to-do list. If you're struggling, our software can help you save 10 hours a week. There's a picture, the push, the good old sales push. Can I have 10 minutes of your time next week to give you a demo? So these that that um that guide that we've written gives you these kind of examples based on those kind of theories so they're really helpful for when we're writing emails and we want to keep to a kind of a structure that helps us do do what we want to achieve keep it short and succinct um within that email um itself so they're really good so by all means a little bit later you you can grab that um that resource and um you can start looking at all of those 10 different um, formulas and seeing whether you can start writing your emails or structuring your emails along those lines. PPP is probably my favourite one. So um, oh, everybody loves a little bit of flattery. And the last, just before we get towards the end, the last thing that we've done is we've put together a, a playbook. So by all means, feel free to steal this. And we've done this playbook, part one, based on pure selling. Um, i.e. trying to get a foot in the door is what we call it, um, rather than doing the marketing version of um, a book on an event, here's a blog and, and so forth. So there's, this is a five email series. I only picked out two to, to show you, but our first one is kind of, I wouldn't say it's hard hitting, but it's picking out the reason why somebody choose, chooses you, your business over the competition. And this one's that kind of, um, hold a mirror up to yourself and you need to be you need to be honest um, and if you can pick out some key bits that you do over the competition and that's great um, and you can take advantage of this but the, the, the playbook kind of makes sure you know send it from somebody ideally the person that owns the account records um, a bit of personalization by putting the, the, the business name in here um, you can put you know why why um, why Nike um, choose Spotler. Oh, sorry. Why? Yeah. Why Nike choose Spotler over the competition or over Mailchimp, over Dynamics? Uh, sorry, over Dot Mailer. If you know those bits and pieces. And what we've done here, this is one of ours at the moment. We've been honest with ourselves and say, actually, why would somebody? Why does somebody come to us? Um, other than you know the features you might get with Mailchimp, Dot Mailer, they come to us because we allow you to send to purchase lists. Mailchimp doesn't. Dot mailer doesn't, they are all, all consent based. Uh, people come to us because we can show you who's on your website. And with that in tow, we can help you get more from your PPC because we can show you those companies on your website. And then this is the, the push. You know, let's have a, a call with you. So that's that's number one. Um, I think this one's number five, but if you download the the um 
the playbook, you'll get all, all of them and you can nick it. We, we're having quite good good responses with this. Uh, some negative, some positive, but the A, B or C is a subject line and just asking people to say, you know, you've got it covered. Um, I'm keen to find out more or now is not the right time. Call back later. These are working quite well. Uh, people doing a few C's, get quite a few people doing an A, some doing a B, but there's no clicks, nothing to to worry about. It's just asking people to do to reply, to simply say A, B or C and tell us to bugger off or to carry on. So uh, hopefully you get the idea of this. Again, there's, there's uh, this one's a five email series and within our product, you, you can stitch it together. So the sales guys, again, they don't have to lift a finger. All they have, well, need to lift one finger. They need to make sure they put the contact that they want to send through the series and what they can do is you know they enter the group they get email one I've got we in in our product we've got conditions that said are they still a lead are they on hold have the sales guy call them if they have obviously we want them to come out if not wait three days get email two same conditions email three same conditions four there's a fifth one in there somewhere the screenshot can fit it in um, but hopefully you get the idea that for cold emails we can set them up and we can send different things and we can treat it slightly differently but as long as we've got a good persona and we've got decent copy we can actually have a go at them and try and get more out of it rather than just sending newsletters um, or blogs or something along those lines we can be a, a lot more salesy to it we just need to make sure the propositions are so i'm almost done recap um for cold emails <coughs> If we can create a connection, we want to try and provide a value. As I said, that credibility of whether you've got um, trust pilot, G2 crowd, testimonials, case studies, flattery definitely goes a long way. And don't be afraid to have that call to action. Um, what we've talked about here is those series for sales. We, you know, we want to make, we want to try and get a meeting, book a demo. Uh, rather than trying to nurture people, we can have that nurture process set up differently. Le these are all for kind of trying to get more leads quickly from that, that cold data. Um, so I hope that's covered everything. Susanna, I'm not too sure whether there's been many questions come through, but if you've got any questions, please ask them. And I think Susanna is just going to come on and see if there's any, and we might have a couple at the moment. Hi Simon. Yeah, that's right. We've we've got about yeah we've got quite a few questions that have come in, so I'm going to try and get oh. through them all. Um, so the first one is: Do you recommend any marketing lists for IT directors in large companies in industries such as retail or telecoms, etc.? Yeah. So we have a couple of providers that well, I've got a couple of providers that I personally go to, and Spotler have some that we have partnerships with. So. If I reel off those, and I'd recommend they're the ones that you have a chat with at least, but um, there's a company called Cognizant. Um, we have one called Market Scan, and then have one called Corp Data. So if you have a look at those, they all they will all have data in that in that area. I'm not sure whether if you're a customer who's asked that or not, but if you are a customer, then by speak to your account manager because we have preferential rates if you go through us at some of those providers. Whereas if you go directly, obviously if, if you're not a customer, we, we can't offer those as such. So um but, but definitely one of those three would be a good place to start with. Um by all means mention that spot that sent you they, they might give you some preferential treatment, you never know. Um, but if you are a customer, then then come to us, speak to your account manager, and we can at least we can start and do the, the hard work for you. So we can get your uh, killer values and your persona sorted, and then we can go and get account for you. Um, so yeah, just I don't know who that was who asked that one. So um, if you're a customer, go go through us. We'll, we'll generally get a better price. Any more? Okay. Uh, next one. Um, the issue we have had is any platform. Our platforms want an opt-in. I know Spotler doesn't. Um, yeah. That's what that <laughs> yeah. So as I said, um, unfortunately, if you use the likes of Mailchimp, HubSpot, Dot Mailer, Click, Dimensions, I could reel off a number of them. They generally, because they are B two C focused, they will work on uh, consented opted-in data um and they won't change their method also because they generally will have you on shared ip pools and everything they don't want you sending to purchase data because obviously 
Um, you will have higher bounces, higher unsubscribes and, and so forth, which is part of part of it. Um, and they they only allow consented data. So um, which is why, as you can see, one of our key um, our key differentiators when we do our emails is we allow you to send the purchase data because in the in the UK under under PECA and GDPR you are legally allowed to um, and it is, as I said it's a cost effective I don't, I don't think I said that at the start but it's a cost effective and great way of trying to fill the top of the hopper top of the funnel from a marketing point of view of generating and driving leads for the sales teams to follow up with and, and nurturing those leads so um, so yeah so most most platforms if they find out you are emailing to non opted in data um and you can kid yourself to say actually my data's opted in it, it isn't um unless you can prove it uh and consented then um at some point they will come knocking on your door and they'll they will stop you and they will close your account we've had it with a few mailchimp and mailchimp customers and dot mailer customers where they've blocked their lists um because they've seen that actually you don't have consent to them you know it's probably info at sales at you're getting a high bounce rate which for mailchimp and dot mailer will all signal that it's not a consented mailing list. Hopefully that covers that one. Um, and by all means, have a chat with us um, more in depth if you want to, and we can kind of talk you through it and show you a demo if you want. But uh, but yeah, we're one of the few providers in the UK that will allow you to send the purchase data. Hopefully that helps. Great. Um, right, we've got a couple of longer questions, Simon. I don't know if you can access the, the questions on here, but I will read them out to you. Um, so this one asks, does it have to be bought data or could you scroll websites, et cetera, and email them um, that the angle, uh, what does it say, that angle code being B2B? Um, so can it be a business address, um, like yeah. having somebody in, or does it need to be an info app email address? No, no, absolutely. Um, you can, if it's, if it's um, publicly listed, uh, B2B, um work email address absolutely so you can go on someone's website uh, go on meet the team and if they've got the email addresses listed there by all means you can you can add it into your database and um process it under legitimate interest it doesn't have to be the info at you again you can still do an info at a sales at marketing app but um you can do the simon.moss at spotler.co.uk uh, as long as you've got a valid opt-out process which is generally an unsubscribe you're you're all you're all good so no you don't have to purchase data as such you can if your sales team are responsible for profiling and they have accounts and they can go on linkedin and you know the you know the um the uh email format um of the company so like i've just told you ours it's first name dot surname at spotler.co.uk so you know susanna's name is susanna bailey you know her email address so by all means start sending her a load of christmas emails um but no in that case it, you don't have to purchase it you can get it off of websites get it off of anywhere that's publicly listed yeah don't send me too many emails please um uh, christmas <laughs> ones are fine um okay so the next one is um we are being told by our parent company that we have to delete all our contact details for any leads or prospects that are not active customers or suppliers I'm pushing back on saying these are B2B, and if we have a legitimate interest, we're okay. But I'm then being told that any email address with an individual's name in, even if it is a business address with a company domain, cannot be kept unless we have specific opt-in consent. From what you are saying, I am correct. Can you please confirm? I all that? can confirm. Yeah, I got all of that. So first of all, I'd say that your company don't know what they're talking about, whoever that is. But if you go on the ICA website, you can absolutely see, go on the DMA website. If it is a corporate subscriber, let's um, use the terminology that the ICA use, i.e. a business email address, you do not need consent to email them. You can run it under legitimate interest. What we'll do is I'll, I'll signpost you to it in a second. If you go on our website and if you go to the top bar under resources, you go to podcasts. We've done a podcast with the DMA, the head of their legal team at the DMA, um, which talks about it as well, saying that legitimate interest is absolutely fine for B2B um, email. So much so that I, the first few slides that I took that I took you through today were from the from the DMA when we did a version of this a few months ago so um, yeah you're absolutely fine you do not need to get rid of them and you do not need to consent 
to process them. You can process them under legitimate interest. Again, just make sure you've done your personas, you've done a balancing test, and you've got job titles in there because there's no, you, you, you know, if you target um, HR staff and then you end up emailing a marketing department, you do not have legitimate interest to to do that. You know, you, you need to make sure your data is in a good place. But yeah, so that one, I know it's a long one, and um, uh, it, as long as it's a business email address and you believe you've got a legitimate interest to uh, do it, you do not need opt-in consent. You just need a valid opt-out process. Obviously. Mine is not legal advice, by the way. So uh, just just so um, you can't come back and sue me, uh, this is not <laughs> not legal advice. By you, you by all means, if your your company might have taken the stance of saying we are only going to do um, we're only going to process under consent, which you can fight all you want. It depends what your company decides. But legally, you can look at it. You can go on the ICO, the DMA website, um, and you can see that you can send to purchase data or to any data if it's a b2b corporate subscriber and the corporate subscriber is just a it's a weird one they're not subscribers it's just how they deem them if it's a, if it's a b2b email address sorry long-winded way of saying yes you're correct and your company's wrong <laughs> that's good news um okay so we've got quite a few more questions just come in simon so there's probably another 10 in the chat box so i'm going to try and get through them all um the next one is what can you do to avoid ending up in the spam or junk email box crikey if i had a silver bullet for that um i'd be <laughs> rich uh there, there so there are a few there's a couple of things so we've got a tool that we use um if and if any customers on on the line uh, make sure you speak to your account manager about it but we use something called send forensics which you can send a test of your email and it will run it through the spam filters and any spam that's happening at the moment. Because as marketeers, we try we tread a fine line about how what we write and how similar it is to what spammers write um, when they try to you know send emails for Viagra and um, you know your 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 great grandmother's left you a plot of land in Sierra Leone we use some of that same terminology and same writing that they write and we just get caught up in spam so there are tools out there that you can run stuff through so as i said litmus i think is one um send forensics email on acid is another um as a customer though you get that as part of the product and i'd recommend that you use it um to, before you send emails so my team are not allowed to send an email out that gets that is a less than 70% predicted deliverability um, through send forensics. If it does, they have to rewrite it or change bits and pieces. So that's one thing. The other thing is it's just it's knowing things like, you know, if you put the word dear in your email, um, that has a point score of two points, I think. Um, uh, so dear Simon, that gives you two points. By default, you've got 4.5 before. Uh, um, from a spam filter out of the box before you get blocked. So you're already halfway there getting blocked if you're using certain words. So again, um, we have an inbox checker, some forensics can tell you certain things that it doesn't like, but um, the, the old basics of trying not to do stuff that spammers do, i.e. dear Mr. Moss, your grandmother's left you X, Y, and Z, is what spammers do. So you don't need to use the word dear. Using the word unsubscribe in your emails, again, I think is running at one point um and legally you don't have to use the word unsubscribe you just need to have a valid opt-out process so you see if you have a look at any emails that we send you most of them will say you know if you don't want to receive any emails from us jump ship um and that jump ship is linked to the preference center so again you just need a valid opt-out process so there's little bits and pieces that you can do to try and help get into the inbox or uh the other folder more so than the uh junk or spam once you're in there you're in you're in a bit of trouble because it's hard to hard to get out um unless people pull you out if that makes sense so uh, i'd also recommend on cold data you depending on um what domain and that you're using that you batch send so again if you're using the likes of mailchimp or 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 dot mailer the reason they don't like using cold data is that you're going to be ruining the ip address that they're using for most of their customers so um uh, if you become a customer of Spotler as such, we we put you up on your own IP, your own domain, or, or you're in a shared IP as such for deliverability uh, purposes. And we allow you to, you know, we talk you through batch sending, warming up IP addresses, so you've got more chance of landing in the the inbox. 
Um, there are options of using your own domain. Um, again, I wouldn't do mass sending from that, but we definitely, uh, Spotler, we use our domain to do those sales emails. So everything looks like it's coming from a salesperson. We know um, our domain is in a good IP pool where the deliverability is quite high and the inbox placement is quite high. Uh, but the caveat to that is we make sure we don't send more than a, a hundred emails a day out of that so it looks like normal sending uh so there's little bits yeah little bits like that um that unfortunately there is no silver bullet uh to to staying out of the spam and junk folder um just testing and refining the other thing that i would say is if people if you know if you've got assets on your website and people have you've got form you've got gated content where people form fill uh, make sure you deliver those as an email rather than if someone hits submit and it takes them to the PDF straight away because that is your optimal time to try and get inbox placement. You know, somebody form fills you rather than giving them the asset straight away, you'll say, uh, thanks for form filling, check your email because we've just sent you the email with the asset to download. And that is the ideal time when somebody will look in their spam folder if it goes into spam and pull you into inbox. So next time you actually send an email campaign, you've got more chance of being delivered into the inbox. So there are little tips and tricks along, along those ways that you can try and get better inbox placement. But um, I definitely yeah, recommend if you bought a, if you're going to go out and buy a data list, um, I would I, and let's say your your current sending is to a thousand people and you just bought a data of ten thousand. We'd I definitely recommend you batch send. You don't send all ten thousand at once because all you're doing is you're kind of putting your head above the parapet to spam filters saying, look, God, I've, this domain normally sends 1,000 emails. Um, now it's sending 11,000. What's going on here? Uh, so definitely look at batch sending and, and warming up that IP address. But again, as I said, unfortunately, trying to do that out of a out of some other providers will be quite, quite tough. So anyway, hopefully that answers your question about how to avoid spam filters and junk. It is, it is damn hard. Um, so once you try as hard as you can to cut that data up, write that data for certain personas, you know, the more targeted you can be with what's in your subject line and your actual emails, and the more relevant it is, the better engagement you're going to get. The better engagement you get, therefore, uh, the more chance you've got ending up in inbox or the other folder before it goes to junk. Sorry, again, long winded, long winded way, but that was quite an open ended question. I wanted to make sure we covered it. Okay, thanks. We've got lots of questions here, so just let me know um, if you want to keep going with this. Um, yeah, when it comes, keep going. yeah, you have to, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next one, when it comes to consent, does legitimate biz business interest apply globally? Uh, yeah, yeah. So legitimate interest is, uh, as I said, it's it's regarding the people that you're targeting. Yes. Yeah, so uh, somebody you had the word consent and legitimate interest in there. You you don't have consent and legitimate interest. You've got one or the other, if that makes sense. Um, so if you if you can legitimately say that you anybody in a business can buy your product or solutions or service, then absolutely. Whereas you know, at Spotler, I can. I can legitimately say that a marketeer or a sales or somebody in the C level, probably not finance or HR, would be re would be relevant for me to target, and I have a legitimate interest. Um, I can use a legitimate interest to process that data. So absolutely, um, you just need to make sure you know who it is you target. You have those values in your CRM. So if you ever did get pulled up on it and the ICO come knocking, you can say, look. This is our personas. This is our balancing test. This is who we target, and this is the makeup of my CRM and the people that I'm emailing. Um, there will be should be no issue with it. Uh, you've got legitimate interest to do it. You can process it under that. And as I said, I can't recommend it enough. Not just because we've done it, but go on to our podcast part of our website and have a listen to the DMA podcast we did. We've even got a customer that did a separate podcast about the reasons they use purchase data um it is well so there's a couple of things on there but the dma one obviously it's a it's a kind of a, not a regulator body but it's a trade body and they do a lot with the ico and it kind of gives you that backup other than just a a marketing director telling you yeah go on use a legitimate legitimate interest but again the ico as well um you go on their website and you can look at um sending under legitimate interest they've got their balancing tests that you can use as a template as well so um yeah the, the two key places the ico you can see on there it says that you can use legitimate interest you don't need consent that's great thank you 
Um, right, next one. Uh, let's see, sorry. Somebody's asking about the advantages of Spotler versus their, their current provider. So I'll, um, I can email um, with that information afterwards, unless you want to answer that. I, I, I think I've, I've rammed home the point in that we're one of the few mm -hmm. providers that you can send purchase data to. So hopefully that's a big enough advantage um, if you're if you're looking at actually increasing your mailing list and using uh, purchase data or cold data, if you like, from a, a lead gen point of view. I guess just to reiterate, the the other two bits that why people generally use us is the IP lookup of being able to see who's on your website, whether it's companies or individuals. And getting more from your ROI campaign using that. So obviously, I'll, as we said, we'll let Susanna. Uh, we'll send you something separately. But there, there are core, our core. I wouldn't say USPs, but reasons why people will leave us, uh, leave Mailchimp, HubSpot, dot Mailer, dot, di uh, dot Digital, sorry, and all those other providers to come to us. Okay, I've got another one here um, yep. on the subject of collecting email data. What accreditation, if any, is needed to resell this data? To resell it, um, a good question. I mean, uh, so I would just make sure that the if you you if you go to Cognizant, you go to Market Scan Corp data, they will have a GDPR policy, and they'll ha they'll tell you how they store it, how they get it, how they collect it. They probably all use. Um, open source domain so you know um, getting it from places uh, from social profiles from um, from websites uh, tele verification making sure that, that that email address is uh, alive probably do SMTP pinging to make sure that the email address doesn't bounce and so forth so there's a number of methods that they use to uh, do it but um having a the the, the legal part of it is that you can send to a corporate subscriber a b2b email address under legitimate interest it doesn't matter where you've kind of got it from if that makes sense it, from an individual but you just want to make sure that provider is obviously not just found a usb key on a train and then they're selling that data on so they, they'll have methods and ways that they get their data and they'll share that with you obviously um if some are part of certain member bodies and so forth then that's great but um as long as you've asked those questions you've done your due diligence then you've got yourself covered okay you can't help it if someone's lying to you and they do sell it and it's from a back of a uh, you know back of a rucksack or something um and they've told you that they do this and that but as long as you've done your your process and you've um you know, I don't mean it. I don't mean it when I say you know, cross your eyes, tick the boxes. You need to make sure that you're happy with their responses um, and their their processes. But as long as you've done that, then you you've got yourself covered. Again, the ICO just expects you to do some due, due diligence and ask those questions. Okay, great. Another one. Um, so, does legitimate interest apply in other countries? Uh, or yeah. just, it's just know, the I, UK. I, it's just legitimate interest to reply. It can, it can apply. GDPR is across Europe. So, as you said, that process of profiling. I can't remember where I did. I think there might, I, I might have done a blog on it, but there was a great, um, I, I nicked it from somewhere as always. Uh, there's a great infographic that showed um, in what countries you can use certain, um, certain process certain parts of gdpr and the, and the reason for processing so i'll try and dig it out but legitimate interest so pekka only reply only is responsible for the uk if it's germany for example you've got double opt-in consent all the way um i think italy as well and i think it's even a, a criminal offense in italy uh, under it as such so what i'm referring to is using legitimate interests for email marketing in the uk um, I'm not going to comment on other countries other than I know that it's different for ever and ever. Sorry, <coughs> it's different for ever EU countries. Um, Susanna, what we'll try and do is in the email, we'll try to put a link into that blog. I can't remember where it is or where I got it from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And sort of linked to that is will you be publishing any guidance on PECA and how things could change? Unfortunately, no. Um, uh, so if you want that, go to the ICO and GDPR uh, and um, DMA. Annoyingly, the e-privacy regulation, when they, they, they've they updated the regulation doc about three or four times over the last 
year or so and every time they update it you read it and then they send another update so you in the industry now you, you've got people that just until it actually gets pushed through they don't want to keep reading 100 pages of documents for the for the um uh European Court of Justice to then go and update it again. So you won't find too much of an update on the e-privacy regulation because they keep changing changing it. So unfortunately, no, I, I, I've given up reading that document until something more concrete comes up. But as I said, I, I, personally, I'd go to the ICO and the DMA for your update on that um, or the ECJ. Um, because you'll get a better a better understanding. And it's just like one of those ones recently, you see the, and again, for any MailChimp users or anybody on the line, the, uh, the ECJ just recently invalidated the privacy shield. So it's kind of, a, not kind of, it's, a, it's illegal to uh, store data, UK data in the US and process it. So I know like the likes of MailChimp and so forth, they're using this, the standard contractual clauses of processing data which isn't the issue. The issue is actually storing the data in servers in, in outside of the EU. So again, it's little bits like that is, is good to be aware of. Um, again, and another reason why those types of, um, sorry, people using those ESPs are coming over to us because we store all the data in the UK. But hopefully that, that helps on that one. Mm -hmm. um, what is a good open rate and a good reply rate on cold data? Oh, crikey. Uh, so if we look at, let's just say, on average, you'll, for cold data, you're going to get about a 1% click-through rate. Um, open rate, I really don't care about open rates because if you know how an open rate is calculated, it's a load of rubbish. So open rates are calculated on, a, on an image download uh, or what, what the industry calls a beacon, a one by one pixel in every email that goes out uh, through ESPs. If that image isn't downloaded, um, it doesn't count as an open. If it is downloaded, it's counted as an open. On iPhones, images are downloaded by default. On Outlook, images are blocked by default. So if your if if your metrics are based on open rates, then unfortunately you're deluding yourself. But if you if if you get commissioned on open rates, then just make sure you send everybody with an iPhone, you'll get a lot more commission. Um, click through rates, so about one percent click through rates, uh, sub one percent, you'll be looking on cold data, which is why I, I mentioned top of the funnel. Um, if you're doing mass emailing, top of the funnel. But if you've got uh, um 5000 contacts you do an email i'll give you about 50 leads so from a lead gen point of view it's a great method and if you're ma mailing that data on a frequent basis you'll get a sub one percent click you might get better if you cut that data up and you're doing more targeted comms you know so if you if you buy if you buy 5000 contacts of sales marketing c level contacts and if i send them an email a generic email i expect to get a sub one percent if I'm doing something much more targeted, you're looking at, uh, you know, the two to three to four percent click through rates. So cutting it down and making it more targeted is good. Those methods that I've showed you earlier of the, the salesy ones, we try to bring those in line with um, with uh, the sales team. So sales teams are also calling those accounts and therefore then they're firing over those emails. So it's, it's not going on mass, if that makes sense. You know, it could be going to no more than 20 a day but the process is following it through. And those we see a much better click-through rate on or a much better engagement on. So it's kind of, it's horses for courses. It depends on what you're doing with that data. But cold data, mass mass mailing, you'll get a sub 1% click-through rate, give or take, and that's the industry standard average. But as I said, from a mass mail point of view, top of the funnel generating leads, that gives you, you know, 5,000 contacts, give you 50 leads to try and nurture down the funnel and get better clicks on those once they're on your website. Okay, great. Um, another one, if we have an established mailing list already, could someone email them given it's to a business address using a personal business email address? Yeah, yeah, so uh, your mailing list, you could, as long as you're happy to, you can process it under legitimate interest. If we take out the concept of bought data, if we just say data, um, uh, GDPR says you are, can either use legitimate interest or consent. So your data, do you have consent to send to it? In the UK, you don't need consent. So let's leave it at that. Um, wherever that data is, whether it's in, you know, you might call it your established mailing list, um, you're either going to process that under consent or legitimate interest. That established mailing list that you're talking about, I can't believe if I said to you, show me how you got consent for that contact, I doubt you'll be able to show me. 
So you'll be processing that data already under legitimate interest, even if you don't think you are. If that makes sense. So yeah, you can definitely email to it as long as it's business email addresses and you've got your personas, you've got your balancing test, and you can prove that you've got legitimate interest, then you're you're good to go. Okay, we've we've got two more questions. Do you want me to oh. carry on? Yeah, go ahead. yeah, I think people are still listening. Um I don't think yeah. all left. Just you and I. <laughs> <laughs> Just another couple. I'll start. Um, my client is a niche IT provider, wants to buy data, but is struggling who to buy from as his target market is SME, typically one to 50 employees. Do you have any suggestions? Oh, crikey. Yeah, that, that is a that is a niche. Um, again, so data is, is it's an interesting one. If you the more niche you get, the much harder it it is. So um, for that scenario, uh, what is it? IT provider specialists. So not industry specific. So again, I, I'd go have a chat with Cognizant on on that one and one of the other providers to see what they can they can get. Um, you, as long as you give them that your your key key criteria there. Um, but I don't know any providers that specialise in in that area. So unfortunately, I can't really help you. I can imagine that is hard to find. Because yeah, the lower you go, the, sorry, the more narrow you go, the harder it gets. But um, IT provider, I can't. I mean. IT provider, they'll probably kind of come under software and then you might be able to narrow it down. Um, one to 50 employees, again, it's always hard to, to do. So um, I don't know if there's a turnover in there that you're after. What what job titles do you go after? Again, we'll knock it down because you're just saying IT provider specialist. Who who who, who do you target within there as well would the, the, the data provider would want to know. So yeah, definitely try one of them. I, yeah, I don't have any... I don't have anything off the top of my head where I could say, yes, this company does IT providers. Um, other than going to good old Google and having a thorough Google, I'd go to one of those two to start with. Okay, great. I think that's I think that's all the questions. Cool. Um, I was going to say that I, I, I saw one come up a bit earlier that we might have missed. Someone is asking, why are we different to Aweber? Um, so... The, the Aweber generally are just generally IP lookup. So we have that version of showing you who's on your website. Um, we try and take it a step further and that we can show you the individual because we drop cookies. But then we've also, the main difference to us is we've got that bigger platform and that you can do email marketing. We've got a social tool for tracking. We've got survey, uh, automation workflow. So we're not, we're, we're an automation platform, whereas A1 Weber is just an IP lookup. It, 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 from a, a crass point of view um so hopefully that helps you it's the same kind of for lead forensics candy uh, and so forth um so yeah so hopefully that is everybody covered um and hopefully you found it useful obviously any more questions by all means uh send them in ask your account manager for the customers on the line uh for the non-customers by all means email or speak to our sales team they generally have a, a certain amount of knowledge and can help you out or at least um talk you through and point you in the right direction and do any demos or free trials and everything so thank you very much um really enjoyed this one last one of the year i hope you all have a merry christmas and uh, a happy new year and we'll see you in 2021 goodbye <laughs>